By the way, I'm George Blumenthal. I'm the director for the Center for Studies in Higher Education here at Berkeley. And um, we do have a regular speaker series, of which this is one. And Devon, who comes to us now from Sacramento, is a man who's already achieved a lot in his relatively young career. Devon is a graduate, has his PhD from the Education Department at UCLA. Uh, and he didn't just go to graduate school at UCLA. He did a few other things in the interim. He served two full terms as a member of the Student Aid Commission in Sacramento, appointed uh, there by Governor Jerry Brown. He also served, uh, among other things, as uh, a student regent, as a student regent designate before then. And that's actually where I got to know Devon. But Devon just wasn't just a student regent. He didn't just put in his time. Devon made sure that he had a real impact on the Board of Regents. Uh, it, was, um, it was through Devon's effort that the regents agreed to start a new special committee on, on what is it called? Basic needs. Basic needs, thank you. On student basic needs, uh, which he chaired. So he's also, I think, the first uh, student regent to ever chair a regental committee. Uh, and in addition, besides that, and, and Basic Needs is a committee that's just continuing and uh, will play an important role over the next few years as the, as the university grapples with the needs of students to actually live besides just going to school. And um, Devine was also the vice chair of one of the standing committees of the Board of Regents as well, which I think is also a first. He even chaired a, a meeting of that committee. So. Um, Devon has had a tremendous impact, and those are those issues are structural. But I mean, he's also had a real impact on policy in a wide range of areas as a member of the Board of Regents. Since getting his PhD, and I might also mention that Devon is also—I'm not sure if he's the only one, but he's one of the few graduate students who became a regent who actually finished their dissertation the same year that they were a student regent. How one actually does that, I have no <laughs> idea. But Devon did. And since graduating last spring, uh, Devon now is a researcher at the California Community College's Foundation, which does research on higher education issues. So I'm so delighted to have him with us today. And um, I guess you could read the title of his talk. Uh, look very much, very much look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, George. Thank you so much, George, for the invite and to the center. It's, it's truly an honor to be speaking to you all. Um, like George said, we had the honor of working together when he was chancellor of Santa Cruz and myself as student regent. And George has always been an advocate for shared governance in the institution. And George has been instrumental for a lot of the roles that exist outside of the regent space. So he's been an advocate for the student regent, was one of the folks to help start the staff advisor position to the board. So any time I needed something, needed a chancellor's perspective, George was someone that I was lucky to have in my corner to have that perspective. So it's an honor to, to be here with you, George, and to see you in this new role as, as director. So um, thank you all again uh, for coming. Um, I'm a, as George said, I'm a research fellow at the Success Center. If you're not familiar with the Success Center network, there are student success units that exist at colleges and universities across the country that focus on student success initiatives. And so ours started in the community colleges a couple years ago. So we're a startup and we work on all of our student success stuff. So outside of financial aid work, I've been doing faculty diversity uh, work for the system. We're looking at local goals that the colleges were required to set by budget language and looking at how their goals roll up to meet the statewide goals that the Board of Governors has set. And so it's been a great opportunity to get to know the community colleges more. But I'm gonna focus on my work in financial aid. So this, is, um, this data is coming from my dissertation research. So the title of this talk is Overregulating Community College Students Through Racist Financial Aid Policies and Practices. So I want to kick off to how I got to this work. And so as George talked about, I served on the California Student Aid Commission. So if you're not familiar with the commission, it is the state agency that administers financial aid here in, um, state, in our state. So Cal Grant, Middle Class Scholarship, DREAM Act dollars, almost $2 billion in aid. I was fortunate on the commission to work with amazing colleagues. One of those colleagues who still serves on the commission is here today, Commissioner Jamila Moore, who is also uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Jamila Moore, who's president at Kenyatta College. And so honored to have served with her on the commission. Um, while I was there, I served as chair of our student impact committee. So I got to oversee directly the program administration of our programs. 
And in that role, I got to look at take-up rates for our Cal Grants. One of the biggest challenges we have is getting our aid in the hands of students. Are we getting the aid that's allocated by the state to those students? And one of the issues that kept on coming up to a barrier for students to get that take-up rate was verification. Mm -hmm. I kept hearing about verification, verification, verification. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the issues that just I was passionate about. And so for the dissertation, I was like, I want to look at this. I want to look at it in the community college context. So you're probably like, what is financial aid verification, if you're not familiar? So it's a random process that higher education institutions use to confirm the accuracy of what students report on the FAFSA form. So a lot of folks think students fill out the FAFSA to get their aid and that's it, they're good to go. There's a much longer process that goes for, for students to secure their financial aid. And so the U.S. Department of Education selects students and the institution's financial aid offices are responsible for conducting verification. So what do students have to do to finish verification? They comply by submitting requested forms and documents to the financial aid offices. So it could be W-2s, tax transcripts, sometimes court documents, birth certificates at times to confirm they are that person, that this information is correct in order to get their aid. And so in a broader context about verification, so recent reporting in 14-15, 5.3 million students were selected for financial aid verification and 98% of those students were Pell Grant eligible. So this means that these are our low income students and our students of color and it's not so random. So it's really why is it that way? In the 2017-18 academic year, campuses reported doubling or tripling of verification requests sent by the Department of Education. Now there are some other reasons for that. That was the year where prior prior year was implemented. So if you're a financial aid person, you know that instead of using that current tax year information, now students input the prior prior year because there's not so much adjustment from their financial situation from year to year. So that did cause a little bit of uptake, but it's definitely important to note that that's there. And then one other concern and what makes verification unique is that there's no standardized process for colleges to conduct verification. So the way that UC Berkeley conducts verification could be completely different than what UC Davis does or UCLA or Kenyatta College to Sacramento City. So that is another challenge that we're running into with verification. So the college that I did my work, why verification was that 73% of students selected for verification do not complete the process. So the site that I did my dissertation research, when we saw these numbers, it was just alarming. That is a lot of students, and that's a lot of aid that's being left on the table. So 73%. So the research question that I'm going to focus on for this talk is mainly the qualitative portion. I'll share some of the descriptive statistics that I think you'll find interesting with those selected for verification is how do community college students experience financial aid verification and structure disbursement dates? And so I'll talk about more about the disbursement dates, but when I started this work, I was really interested in verification and why students weren't receiving their money. One other barrier that I learned was that how community colleges disperse aid to students looks very differently than what, how four-year institutions disperse aid. And I'll get into that a little bit more, and I define that type of disbursement, structure disbursement. So the site where I conducted this work, um, Streamline College, so it's pseudonym um, for a college located in California. There's about 20,000 students at this institution, 77% Hispanic, 6% Asian or Pacific Islander, 6% white, 2% black, and then a little other mixed um, filling in the blanks there. And then at this site, 5,300 students, approximately 5,300 students were selected for financial aid verification. So the conceptual framework that I use to approach this, um, this part is important to me and where the racism piece comes in. Um, I really lean on Sean Harper's work, a professor at USC, his work on race without racism. When we're doing work on community colleges and we understand the racial composition of the colleges, we can't do this work and not talk about how racism influences the structures that exist in the process. And as we know that a majority of Latino and African Americans get their start in community colleges this is the case we have to look at how racism may be factoring into this work. So the two theories that I lean on are um, Pippin and Cloward's Regulating the Poor, and their work helps to really understand the excessive regulations that students experience in the process. Their work was looking at welfare programs and how folks are maligned through that process and, and 
just go, go through these bad experiences to get that, um, their welfare um, aid. And though I don't make the argument that financial aid is a form of welfare, I think there's many similarities that can be made between welfare and financial aid. And then I use Perez, Huber, and Sarlosano's theory on microaggressions, and specifically their piece on institutional racism to talk about how there's inst institutional racism that influences their process. So this figure here is from um, Perez, Huber, and Sarlosano's work. And so you can see at the macro level, um, then you have institutional level, and then micro level. And so at the macro level, um, I argue about how white supremacy informs, and they talk about how white supremacy informs this work. And so I apply that to an example of welfare queens and how that kind of relates to this idea of Pell runners. And so Pell runners is really why this process of verification and structure disbursement started. And I'll talk more about that. And then at the institutional level, that is the verification process, the disbursement process, and then the micro levels where we're going to find the student experiences in the process. So again, um, Pell runners at the macro level. So Pell runners are defined as students that enroll in college and stop attending courses after they receive their financial aid disbursement. So there's this misconception that community college students are going to get their money and run. But there's no data that supports that. And only report that talks about any type of financial aid fraud existing is about like 2.7%. So there's just been this idea that community college students who again are students of color, who are low income students, are taking this money and they're out. And so this is what's informing why verification is existing and why structured disbursements. At least that's what I'm arguing. And then with institutional <coughs> racism, we have our financial aid and disbursement policy. So again, the verification and disbursement. And then micro, capturing the student experiences in the financial aid process. So I really want to emphasize that. And then, you know, financial aid and racism, it's not, you know, this topic that I'm throwing together. There's more and more work that's being produced on this. So my colleagues, White and Dosh, um, have looked at how racism exists and influences financial aid at both the levels of the individual, students and staff, and institutional with financial aid policies. And they use a colorblind racism approach to look at this at a community college in New York. And then Hippolyte and Tikkabakunda, I totally am um, butchering that there, but um, Antar, um, they're um, USC folks. Um, they use critical race theory to study financial aid. And their work found that racism <coughs> took the form in uh, racial stereotypes and microaggressions, added labor in searching for scholarships, and a factor in re reinforcing the racial wealth divide. Though this study is a four-year institution, it still provides an understanding that there needs to be more work looking at the intersection of financial aid and race and racism. So the data for this study, so it was a mixed method study. So for the quantitative data, I had institutional data from Streamline College, and that data set was those who were selected for verification. Um, I wish I had the broader data set. I wish I had everyone who was selected for financial aid, but there was a lot of data problems at this site. And as I shared in an earlier talk, you know, we're at, here at UC Berkeley at a great research university where you're going to find a research unit in almost every division. We're at this college, there was one institutional researcher that left in the middle of my dissertation study, and so all these different things, but data is privilege, and so because the federal the government does not share information on um, verification, and the chancellor's office in the community college doesn't collect who's selected for verification, you have to go about this college by college, and so that goes to this argument of we need this data, because of course folks can say, well, this is your experience at one college, I get that, I understand, but this work is important and we've got to push it so we can get that data to make more understanding of this. And then for the qualitative data, I conducted an interview with 21 students and four staff members at Streamline College. I'm going to focus on the students' experiences navigating verification and the structured disbursements. Um, these were students who were selected for verification. So these students range from first years to uh, multiple years at the institution. Some of them have been selected for verification every year that they've been to. One of my students, um, his twin brother was selected and their older sister was selected. So all in the same household, all being selected for verification, which really doesn't make sense. Why do you need someone who has the same household reporting the same information? Um, so um, th that is where the data is coming from. And then this is just the um, study design. So I used the sequential methods. Um, if you're not familiar with this design by Cresswell and Cresswell, I um, analyze the quantitative data first and use that to help inform the qualitative sample um, for the study. 
I conducted the interviews and conducted the analyses and then compared the qual and quant results. So just a quick overview of the findings. Uh, with the quantitative findings, I'll just share some of the basic descriptives so you can get an understanding of you know, what the sample of those selected for verification looked like. So I'll talk about race and ethnicity, gender, and then the disbursement dates and kind of how that raised a red flag for me doing this work. And then for my qualitative findings, they'll all focus on verification disbursement dates. Some of the other issues that came out of these interviews were just students' overall experience with financial aid at Streamline College. This data is really kind of the data that supports a lot of the stuff we know about financial aid, kind of it being a confusing process and that just general stuff that has been produced about financial aid. Next thing that I found was engaging, how students engage with the financial aid staff, the ineffective communication that there was with the financial aid office, and then how students would rely on other campus departments to get support. So a lot of students would share that they would either go to the counseling office or first year success center or different places to get the support in the financial aid process. And then lastly, of course, financial aid fraud and race and how those intersections and how the staff saw verification as a way to check for fraud and how race factors into this piece and how the students saw that. So um, I'll talk about race and ethnicity. So here um, um, in the left column, you'll see the total enrollment for race and ethnicity. And then on the right, you have those that are selected for verification. So you'll see here with Hispanic, they make up 77% of the student population but 87% of students selected for verification. With whites, they make up 6% of the total population, but 1.6% selected for verification. And then with gender, with the total population, our males are 55% and the total population selected at 43%, females are 43 total, selected at 55%. So again, you would think that it would be representative of what the school is, but it's not. So why is that? So the first piece about navigating the verification process, I wanted to map it out using the student interviews. So they explained to me the process that they went through. So the first thing is when they're notified for verification. They receive a notice um, by the financial aid office, an email that, hey, you've been selected for verification. You need to get this done so you can get their aid. So what they have to do is they have to access the Streamline College Verification Worksheet. So this, there are two worksheets at the college, one for independent students and one for dependent students. And so the dependent students will have sections for their parents' information and stuff like that. And so once they get those forms, they have to provide the information that's being requested. So they may have to fill out their household size, how many people are you living with. They may have to provide their W-2s, tax transcripts. One issue that kept coming up was the tax transcripts. The students would talk about how, I'm loving hearing the, the nods and the room, and I'm doing something right here. Um, IRS, if they, did, if they could not find their tax transcript, they would have to reach out to the IRS, and it would take like three to five weeks to get the tax transcript in order for them to submit the form. Once they got all the info that they had, they would send it to the financial aid office, and the financial aid office would review. Now, the financial aid office could take anywhere from three to five weeks to review verification. So now if the school year has started, and they had to wait three weeks for IRS to come in, now three to five weeks for you know, review, it's almost the end of the semester. And one thing that was just so unfortunate, I did my interviews in the spring semester, February, March, out of the 21 students I interviewed, 10 students had only received their aid. So almost a half were still waiting for, for their aid, and the disbursement dates also connect to that. So getting back to the chart, so once it's reviewed by financial aid office, if everything is all good, it's approved. If it's not, it's kicked back, and then the students have to go through the whole process all over again, and they don't get to be at the front of the line for review. They have to go back into the queue for the whole three to five week process. So um, this is how the students described the verification process. So notification. So Kim, a first year political science major, shared how she was confused. She thought everything was in order with her application. And she was just kind of like, what could be wrong with what I did? I thought I was good to go. My FAFSA was submitted. What's going on here? Um, locating documents and completing forms. So this was just a huge barrier for students to like, where did I put those documents? Or mom and dad, where's the tax stuff? So Miguel, a third year computer science major, talked about he, how he had to come back and forth um, to the financial aid office and ask them, OK, is this the correct document that I would need? Is there someone here that can help me fill it out? Or what do I need to fill out certain things like that? So just this back and forth of like, did I grab this right form? Is this what you need? Is this what's being requested? 
um, just wild that the student had to keep uh, going through that experience. So now jumping to disbursement dates and how this stood out to me. So how I describe the disbursement dates um, is that at a typical university, you disperse aid at fall semester and you disperse aid again at spring semester one time. But at community colleges, it works a little bit differently. Now, so at colleges with Pell Grant, for example, you'll see here at Streamline College, they give you it's half of the award because it gets divided. Your half of the award get half in spring, half in fall, half in spring. But they divide that 50% up in 30% in August, 30% in September, and then 40% in October. And when I was talking to students, some of the students were like, that 30% is not even enough to pay all my books, to pay for my parking pass. So I have to wait around for this money. Now some <coughs> students liked it. Some students were like, it's like a paycheck. And so um, why colleges do this, part of the reason is for um, return, uh, return to Title IV because colleges don't want these students to end up dropping out and then having to track down that student and pay that, back that money. That makes sense. But again, at what rate, rate is that happening to warrant such a restrictive process? And um, TICAS, the Institute for College Access and Success, I have to give them a shout out for this. They have done work on this and they call it aid like, like a paycheck. I think that's great, but I think it gives a more positive connotation to this, and I think it's a little bit too positive because we really still have so much to explore on this issue. We even see similarly with Cal Grant. They give 50, they do, so 50% in um, September, and then 50 in um, March, and then the loans, they, um, they break up the loans, 50 and 50 and 50 and 50 um, in the semester. And so um, Martin, a second year criminal justice major with um, structured disbursements, he said, you know what, I need to borrow some money as he was talking to his mother. I need to borrow some money, roughly like a couple hundred fifty, two hundred dollars to pay for my books and the mater materials I need. And she goes, all right, that works. I'll just give you the money and then just give me it back to me when you get your FAFSA. So again, if a student is selected for verification and then if they get their verification approved on August 16th, they don't get their aid. They have to wait until September 21. And that doesn't mean they get 60%. That means they only get 30% and they won't get that 30 again until the makeup date at the end of the semester. So these students are borrowing money for their parents because they're waiting for their aid. They may have already been approved, but they missed the disbursement date. So that was what Martin is um, describing here. And luckily, his mother was able to provide him for his money. And look at this, $150 or $200. That's not a lot of money. <coughs> these students are waiting for a little bit of money for their educational expenses. And so you may be like, Devon, this is this one college, but it ain't. So I use Berkeley City College as an example. So you're not going to be able to read the, this, but this is directly from their website. So y'all can see that this is coming from. So their fall 2019 disbursement dates, August 15th, their first disbursement of 12 of, of Pell is 25%. Then in September, 25%. And then October, 50%. So they do 25, 25, 50 at Berkeley City College. But at San Francisco State University, on January 22nd, 2020, or yeah, they all got their money, that 100%, they're good to go. I wasn't able to look up Berkeley because you gotta have the Berkeley login or something, but I assume it's the same. And when I think of Berkeley City College, you know, their students probably have higher cost of living than a San Francisco State student because these students are gonna probably be older, they're gonna have children, so if we have the same cost of living, why are we dispersing it to our students so differently? So I wanted to just draw on that. This is a, a huge problem here in our um, inequities amongst the segments. So in summary and, and from my, my paper, in a sense, the term Pell Runners became a tool to inform policies such as verification and structured disbursement, which overregulate financial aid for students who need aid to access their higher education. These policies took shape because the idea that students were gaming the financial aid system caused colleges to target and penalize low-income students and students of color. That's where I'm at on the issue. Maybe I'm wrong, and you know, we gotta keep exploring this, but this is where I'm at on the issue. <clears throat> and so in my discussion, um, Pivot and Cloud's work really helped to understand the over-regulation that leads to delay of receipt of aid. Because the verification process is so, so cumbersome, and then because how aid is dispersed, it's just over-regulation and it just seems almost unnecessary. So again, students have to engage with the FAFSA. Then they have to deal with the worksheet. Then they have to get the supporting documents. And that doesn't even factor when they have to go to the CSAC website, you know, to deal with Cal grants and stuff. So these students are dealing with multiple medians to get their aid. 
Um, again, only 10 participants have received their aid by interviews in spring semester. My last interview was in March. So students in March had not received any aid. And this other work that has been done looking at financial aid or community colleges, Campbell, uh, Delamin, and Rios Aguilar talk about how verification is a climate of penalty. And um, Cesar Davis at all, a paper that we presented at the American Educational Research Association, we really make the argument that, you know, it's pro financial aid and community colleges is processing the poor. It's processing poor students is all that these things are doing. These are students who need the money, who need the aid, and we're just making them go through this ridiculous process. Furthermore, with verification, um, many of the, the students that I interviewed were not ex anticipating any change to their aid. And that supported the National Association of Student Financial Aid Administrators. They, 84% of students selected for verification experienced no change in their award amount. So if verification is to make sure that folks aren't lying or putting you know, wrong information, and 84% don't experience any change, again, you know, why is verification needed, or at least at the rate of which it's happening? So the recommendations, I'm very lenient with the recommendation. There's some folks who are like, get rid of verification entirely. I, you know, make the argument that, you know, U.S. Department of Education should verify at the rate of confirmed financial aid fraud. So most recent report I was able to find was that it's 2.7%. So verify at 3%. It should not be this 30% number that's made up out of nowhere or that, that colleges get to decide. It should just be a 3% across the board and keep it at what we think fraud is happening. Here, because um, verification is done by the colleges and the institutions, I really think that the California Community College Chancellor's Office <coughs> should implement a system-wide verification standards and that there should just be one form that all the colleges use. And this is important in the community college context because you have students that are attending multiple colleges. That I have one student in my um, study who had been selected at verification for both of the colleges that he was attending at the same time. And if those districts don't have an agreement between them, they won't honor and make the student have to go through verification at both campuses. So the community colleges is really in a position to do something from a system-wide standpoint, and I, and I hope that happens. And I think students should be given an option on how they would like their financial aid dispersed. If the students like the paycheck and that works for them, cool. You know, you want to get it throughout the, the semester as a way to manage your money, that's fine. But again, for those students who have higher need, you know, these are adults. Let them get to decide on how they would like their aid to be dispersed. And so for future research, for me, I really want to dive into structured disbursements and really how are we dispersing aid at the community colleges. So, you know, kind of what extent does the, this dis dis structured disbursements exist in the community colleges and which students are subjected to these policies? Can we at least understand that? And I think by just looking at financial aid websites alone and looking at their dates and then looking at the institutional data, we may be able to find some interesting stuff about how we're dispersing aid to which type of students. And then what are the role of the financial aid staff in supporting students through the, the process? So I interviewed staff in, uh, in my study and I didn't share the, the data that was collected from them. But I will say that I think um, in the financial aid world, um, we're not looking at it as a student service or a student support, student affairs perspective. It's almost like an auditing um, type of support. And that's not the role of what a financial aid office should be. And I get that there are staffing issues, there's a struggle to get some of this done, but again, we really have to make sure that we're that this is we're doing we're not doing this from a deficit perspective, that we are supporting our students through this process. <clears throat> and so with that, I'm happy to take any questions or discussions at this time. Thank you all so much. Yes. So if you look at all about um, you know, what it costs to um, apply these verification programs versus the amount that, um, you know, they try to get back from students, especially since the students are getting so relatively <coughs> small amounts at the community college. Yeah, that's a great question. I have not done that work, but I think that would be very interesting to, to see if that study. And again, it goes back to that data piece of like, this would have to be done by college, by college because of the data restrictions, but it, it should be um, looked at. And how much time our staff playing and verifying, you know, using their time on the clock to verify different um, files would be interesting to see. Yes? So based on what came out from NASPA and basically the department not looking at the data to tweak who's being selected, what's your thought about the QA program? Mm -hmm. And since it's gone away, 
do quality assurance program? Oh yeah, the quality assurance. Mm -hmm. um, I have not studied into that oh. um, um, too much, but um, can you kind of speak more to So to just the letting schools evaluate their own data yeah, yeah, and yeah. come up with their own criteria yeah. so that we can avoid selecting the same students over oh, or oh, yeah. Your rate. Yeah. So. No, I think I think <laughs> if, the, if the schools get to decide that would be... It went away a few years ago. Yeah, yeah, I so, mean that, yeah. that would that would be better. I mean that they know their student population and would be able to to make that <laughs> judgment but you know with the department stepping back in yeah. you know they that you know they have the Pell Grant which our students need. Jamil. So have you, Yvonne, have you shared this with the statewide chancellor's office? Because I think your recommendation for a, they should be doing a system-wide verification, because I think that's an excellent idea with 115 community colleges. Uh, if you haven't, is, is there a plan to do that? Because I think this is invaluable information for them. Definitely. I have not shared it with them, at least in an official way. I just need to walk up the stairs to the sixth floor <laughs> <laughs> in the office and, and do that. But, um, I definitely uh, will share that and, um, and talk with the folks in, in the financial aid unit um, uh, because it would be interesting to see, you know, if it can be done. And as you know with the governance structure, Jim, you know very well, the Board of Governors has limited, you know, oh, yes. uh, over, <laughs> oversight of the colleges because of the individual <laughs> districts. So I don't know how successful uh, the Chancellor's Office or the Board of Governors would be in an effort like that. But there is financial aid reform that's taking shape. That's been something that the Student Aid Commission has been working with and the Community College Chancellor's Office. And so in those conversations, I talk about how we're dispersing aid and verification. So I'm hoping that we are able to work into that as uh, we continue to have these ongoing discussions during this budget process about financial aid reform in the state. Yes? Well, you touched on two things that I was very familiar with. I had four kids, and the four of them were going to different colleges at one point, and all of them getting financial aid. Mm -hmm. um, all of them were selected for verification. So it was kind of interesting to know that you know, information was being provided, yet the different colleges were asking for the same information. Mm -hmm. Two of them were going to a system college in which um, information were uh, shared, I guess, okay. but yet they were still being asked to provide the verification. Mm -hmm. When I got into the IRS uh, page to try to get the verification, most of the time the page never worked. Mm -hmm. So we had to, I had to ask for the mail to be sent to me directly. So that did take yes. three to four weeks you know, to get in. And that's a great point because I forgot to share during as I was collecting this data, the government shutdown happened. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. so students right. could not access right. some stuff. So part of this is on the federal government for shutting down for as long as it did. Yeah. But um, that, that is just, they were not able to get access to the mm -hmm. online forms and had to wait for it to come through snail mail. Right. It didn't <laughs> uh, but thank you for, for sharing that. Yes? I have a question about that. Financially, um, I've heard from, from community college financial aid um, officers that they don't have much, way, uh, much in the way of incentives to give out financial aid at all, uh, both in two ways. One, that they, didn't, they don't get much funding to help students you know, apply and and, and uh, you know deal with the you know with, with things like, like like verification afterwards, and also that you know half the students aren't even paying anything in you know in tuition, so that the, you know whatever money they're getting from a Pell grant or whatever is going for non tuition expenses. Um, at, in talking with um, you know your sources, did, did this come up, and how big of a problem do you think it is? Yeah, I think with like the seventy three percent number that I shared at the college, I was I, I'm sure there's students who. We're like, it's not worth the headache, you know. I, I don't need that money. I have my blog waiver in, or I'm good. I'm going to have a job this semester. So I, I think that piece is there. And again, I want to touch on the staffing piece again. I think financial aid offices would love more staff. Most units on any campus or organization would love more staff. And I think they'd be able to provide the help that students need and provide the eyes to um, approve the files as they're selected for verification. But yeah, I think there's a whole host of things of why reasons students would not want to go through the process. Jamila. Uh, did you get a chance to touch on any of the kind of piggybacking on your question is the issue of cost of attendance. There's a perception that because we have fees and fees are low, that, that certain students can navigate this. But that's assuming that you, you're talking about students that have what I call the parental safety net. Yep. Mm -hmm. There are many students who don't have a parental safety net. Yep. And so they are adults and they have kids. Yep. So when they look at this perspective of trying to take care of fees and textbooks, the issue of, and the what I have found the use of the Pell Grant is really taking care of those cost of attendance, transportation, rent, food. Yeah. 
uh, and trying to, you know, navigate that process. Did any of that weigh into some of your research with regards to those students who were waiting weeks with no verification? How were they eating? How were they paying for things? Yeah. Yeah, so it, what was unique in my um, um, sample, all the students that had not received aid all had received some type of money from their parents. So it was around that 100 to 300 mark. And that, I thought that was unique that there weren't some students. And then there were students that had, you know, um, the bar waiver that was on file so they knew that, you know, they weren't going to get kicked out of classes because of fees. And then some students had the, the book waivers that I either CalWORKs or, yeah, EOPS provide. So some of them were good, but it was still just like, well, I, I got to pay my share of the rent, or you know, I you know got to you know pay you know for my car and stuff. So it's kind of just like I need it, but I'm not you know dying for it right now. So there definitely was that. But then I also had you know two students who had kids, and you know any money is great money. And I think again doing research on community college, especially qualitative. I mean, my sample just looks so. There's just the students are so different, and that's why I didn't like share the the chart of the <laughs> students with you because it's just they're just all over the map of, and that's how the community. I mean, the community colleges serve so many students from so many different backgrounds, but all that kind of came out in the in the interviews. Zach? Uh, I'm just wondering why you think that, uh, just what was the, what in the policy at this community college led more Hispanic and black students to be verified than white nation students? I, I guess, in yeah. particular, I'm asking because I assume that whatever information is available to either the financial aid office or maybe the Department of Ed, whoever's making this verification choice, yeah. that information probably doesn't include race. They're, they're probably no. not explicitly selecting no. race. Yeah. So I'm just wondering what you know about the verification yeah. process and why that happened. It's the poor students. Yeah. That's what, it, it's making the students prove that they're poor. Yeah. And so all the students that were selected and that I interviewed are waiting for a Pell Grant. And so it was to, <clears> to <throat> verify that that student was really that poor. That's what it comes down to, because you're so right, the department does not know what their race is. Um, and I think if I, you know, looked at, if I had their income or EFC and ran EFC next to like what the white students were, we'll probably say that the white students were probably had more, you know, I guess probably were, had a higher, you know, economic status and so therefore maybe not waiting on aid or, or whatever, so, yeah. So is that racist? That's a great question. I think that um, when we, again, contextualize it to the history of the policies and how they came about, it's racist. We can't forget about this idea of Pell Runners and where that idea comes from and how white supremacy informs that thought. So again, that's why this conceptual approach is important because we can't just look, we can't just take the numbers of face value, we have to contextualize it to the history, to the, the how we're naming it, how we're calling it, and I think Pell Runners is as racist as it comes, and how it's structured to limit Pell Runners is racist because it's going after these low-income students or students of color. I wonder, do you have any statistics as to the number of students who were white who got who are Pell eligible, and whether they were asked to be verified? I don't have that info, and again, uh, I just it kills me on the inside because I wish I, I had that data, and it was so tough to just to get this data alone. And so that's what I hope to continue the work is working with colleges to get that verification data so we can answer some of these important questions. And again, some of the, the earlier slide I showed you with like, you know, the you know 98 percent of students being Pell eligible, like all that, like that's the, the information that we know, you know, at a national level it's like it's really harder to get down because it's that individual that data is held at the institutions george could you say a little bit about how long the process would take at a four-year college compared to the community college that you studied <laughs> uh, probably would be longest would probably be four weeks if the student was able to get everything that would be my guess because i feel like the four years would have the resources but i'm hearing some some disagreements anybody else, anybody else in the room yeah, yes, please, please, please. We're all looking at each other. Four year i think it depends on resources right i yeah. think and for us what i will say is that um and i say us because i'm all my colleagues in the room who are here um multiple things happened at what time too for us and yeah. so it took even longer like systems changes prior prior yeah. Um, the, I, the IRS shut down, like, right, several things happened at the yeah. same time, and so our, it took us a lot longer, and staffing, right? And yeah. so there were multiple things, I think, impacted yeah. um, our, our population of students, yeah. if you want to add to that. But I don't think that's right on. 
And I would just say I really appreciate the framework. I think as we're as uh, on our campus as we're working to diversify, just understanding where we our goal is not to cause more harm for yeah. students. Right. And um, but we're balancing the fact that we do get audited, you know, as a financial aid office, we do get audited, yep. and the department I think is as untrusting as a camp to you know to a campus like Berkeley to a proprietary <laughs> school. <laughs> and so it would be great if there would be recommendations or incentives for schools that demonstrate that they uh, have the administrative capability and that they're awarding the funds um, correctly to have some administrative relief, yeah. which would help us to have a more student-centered approach uh, to the work. Yeah, one of the, the papers that I cited, the Campbell, Campbell et al., they talk about their recommendation is that the Department of Ed just give a block grant of money to the institution and let the institution decide, you know, awards to the students and then let the institution, again, be responsible for the verification because you can hold the institution accountable so you don't have to re re worry about the return to, return to uh, Title IV type stuff. And and I think that's that. where QA would come into yeah. play, right? Yeah. Because it would allow us to look at our data, decide who it is we actually need to select based on errors and changes yeah. um, versus what who they're selecting. And what, what's interesting is <clears throat> in the QA program, every two years, they would do an analysis of how effective you were in the QA program, right? right. So then they right. would share we the data and they would say, this is how, yeah. based on this, this is how effective you are. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting. It doesn't seem like they use in use much of the QA data that they gathered from schools when it went away, and then they move forward with regular full federal verification for all institutions. Yeah. And and so I would love to know what that data shows and yeah. like, you know where it is. Yeah, this is so helpful. I'm happy that the financial experts, the real experts, are in the room because it is a, it's such a huge, you know, it's a behemoth of, of stuff. And so even talking about the QA and not, me not being as familiar with that, there's just so much more to explore and so many mechanisms that the department has used and no longer uses. And so um, that, that's super helpful in other areas of possible inquiry for, for my work or someone else's work. Yes. So, <clears throat> I was at the Department of Education in 2009-10 when they made some changes to the regulations around verification, mm -hmm. and I recall uh, the staff saying, you know, we're requiring verification in the same way of everybody, it's all standardized, it'll be a lot better if we have a system where we can, um, where we can change it up and, and pick certain things and not have to verify everyone all the same, you know, yeah. to do it to make it easier so that it's not as, as uh, comprehensive uh, because it doesn't need to be. I'm curious whether you or anyone knows whether, did it actually end up worse than it was before that? Like, did, did that not turn out the way that was planned? Or, or is it better but just still bad? <laughs> my financial aid folks. <laughs> I mean, my sense is, because there, there are now what they're calling targeted populations, right? So um, my sense, though, is that those groups where there are lesser things to verify or, or fewer things that we need to verify, that population is so small, at least on this campus, like, that most of our students are being selected for the full thing. And are people who are using the IRS IRT, like when they're applying for the FAFSA, mm -hmm. they're still asked to verify, yeah. even though there could be other things yeah, even to though verify, the data is so like household like size, household number of college, yeah. right? And even if you're, um, when you're submitting the forms, when they ask you, do you want to retrieve, use the data retrieval, right. um, they still ask you. Right. So you're getting all that information. And I think that the thing to look at in that particular scenario is who are the students or families that are actually using the IRS data retrieval? Because it's right. not the easiest. Yeah, right. And I've been doing this for a long time, and I had to help somebody do this a couple yeah. of years ago. It's not the easiest thing to do. Right. And so... If you think about that, who are the folks that are ver that are going that path to verify income versus the ones that aren't? Mm -hmm. You'll probably find something very similar. Oh, definitely. Yeah. 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 And <clears throat> I would also add, it also depends on the institution right. and right. the flexibility of their yeah. systems, right? Yeah. So, if like so, if somebody uses data retrieval, they don't have to verify income um, data, but not all institutions have the ability to be as targeted, and so they'll just say, "Oh, you've been selected for verification." So even though we have the information from the IRS, we're still going to collect a copy of the tax return. Because we have no way of separating that out from. So you might ask for more than the Department of Education is right. even <laughs> requiring of you. Yes. Oh, interesting. Okay. Because the systems are flexible. 
Great. Any other questions or thoughts or comments, Jamila? In your in your research, Devon, did you like you said, like you started out with a certain number of students and ten of them out of the twenty one still not received their aid. Mm -hmm. During the course of that time, because there was a lot going on, you said also too that you um, there was a government shutdown. Were there any changes within the institution? Like were they having system changes or upgrades or did they lose staff or because that also on both sides mm -hmm. And, and as we call it in our world, secession planning. Did you have somebody retire yeah. and then there wasn't anybody there to backfill? Because that has a huge impact. Yeah. And if you found that, did you did you include it in any limitations or something? Because I, I know that can have some, an impact. In the data piece, I talk about the, the data and how um, the financial aid office used like um, Banner or, or yes. something like that. And yes. then, you know, IR uses, you know, PeopleSoft, and then another part of the campus uses Starfish or something. And so, so I'm like, look, this, the data is, I think, a huge issue. And so when they were transferring over some stuff to different data systems or having data systems to talk, I think that may also be um, an issue. And I think it comes down to, to the data and how the campuses are able to identify these students and, and track these students throughout the, the process. Yes. Um, I just want to say thank you for researching this and for presenting. Uh, this is like really like the reason why I'm in graduate school. I was in college at Bison working on CBOs. And also, I saw students um, over and over get selected for a verification. So we say, oh yeah, we want more low income students to go to college. But what I was seeing and what I experienced too was like all these little barriers that no one talks about verification. What is a transcript when a 17 year old? doesn't know what is that. I didn't know either. I had to yeah. kind of figure it out. So mm -hmm. thank you. And I hope that um, the things that you mentioned are information that I'm going to make sure that you continue to forward. Well, thank you so much for that. I really, really appreciate it. And I appreciate the folks that are boots on the ground supporting students through this through the process because I mean it's it's very personal and as you sit and hear those stories from a qualitative perspective I mean you almost want to cry at the resilience of no, these students yeah. that go through and and I almost put up there for future research like why do students persevere through verification but then it's like they need the money you know? exactly. <laughs> that's why they persevere so I mean I just you know and I think of agency it's like there's no way a student at UC Berkeley is going to allow you to go all the way till March without without paying them and these students are just like it's the process, you know, this is what happens. And it's just like, there's just no way that would happen anywhere else. And I, in my opinion, at a different institutional context. So um, there's a lot of work that has to be done. But it is true what you said about some of the students wanting to just give up because they don't want to continue and follow through with the process, you know. Um, my daughter was one of them. She was uh, having so many issues with the, um, with the Cal Grant. Um, she was just ready to give up, and I said, no, you have to find out. All she needed was just verification of a high school to be, you know, graduation date. Yeah. Um, but that is not really that accessible. I mean, she needed to call me on the line for a long time yeah. and, and yeah. try to get that, and sometimes that takes time, and it could yeah. be, you know, time consuming. Yeah, sometimes you can't go to the high school, you have to go to the district, and exactly. it's the district that, I mean, it's just, yeah, I heard some of those horror stories, and that's wild. Anything else? Well, again, thank you all so much. I'll stick around. Happy to talk. Really appreciate it. Thank you, John. Thank you, Joe. Thank you so much.